I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We're executive directors of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Today, we will be asking Stanford professor Robert Sapolsky, do we have free will? The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. Do we have free will? Our guest today says no, and that this is a good thing. Robert M. Sapolsky is a professor of biology neurological sciences and neurosurgery at Stanford University and he's a recipient of a MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant. His many books include A Primate's Memoir, Monkey Love, The Trouble with Testosterone, and Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Robert Sapolsky's 2017 book, Behave, was a New York Times bestseller and was named Best Book of the Year by the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. His newest book, just released in October by Penguin Press, is called Determined, A Science of Life Without Free Will. Welcome to Free Thought Matters, Professor Sapolsky. Well, thanks for having me on. It's great to be back with you guys. Yes. It's been more than 20 years, you know. We first met you in 2002 after I read your amazing book, A Primate's Memoir, about living with baboons in Africa, an amazing book. Since then, you've kindly become a member of FFRF's honorary board. And you also received FFRF's Emperor Has No Clothes Award that year. And before we talk about your new book, what are your views on religion? Um, your basic sort of person who would hang out with you guys. I was raised uh, quite religious um, in a fairly orthodox setting, and I believed and I carried out all the rituals, which in retrospect was mainly what I was doing, because all I did in those days was things that would get people to say I was a good boy. And somewhere when I was about 14, um, I had a very epiphanal night where I decided that night not only was there no free will and no purpose to anything, but sort of God went by the side at that point as well and has not been back. And I have since then uh, not been capable of a shred of religiosity or spirituality about anything. <laughs> so you said that you realized at a young age that there's no free will. And your book is called Determined, a fascinating topic. Uh, but how do you define this free will that you don't think we have? What is free will? Well, let me start with what it isn't, because people's intuition usually take them to this place where they start, both start and stop, um, which is built around the notion of intent. You form an intent to do something, and then you do it. And what the questions then swirl around uh, concern, did you consciously intend to do it? Yes, that is the case. Did you understand what the consequences were likely to be? Yeah. Did you understand you were not being coerced? There were alternatives available. Uh, yes. And at that point, most people conclude that you have just displayed free will. You have demonstrated your agency. Uh, you could be celebrated or held culpable for what you just did. And in fact, most criminal trials revolve around exactly those issues once they decide they've got the person who actually did it. And the notion is once you've got intent identified, 
you've answered things. You now know that uh, free will was on the scene and you can act appropriately. And for my money, that has absolutely nothing to do with free will because it's got this very myopic emphasis. I sort of the metaphor I keep coming back to is it's like you're asked to review a movie, but you only get to see the last three minutes of it. Because what that approach does is ignore what is ultimately the most important question in terms of free will. No one is sitting there saying, great, well, they intended to do that. They knew they could have done otherwise, blah, blah. Where did that intent come from? How did they become the sort of person who would intend to do that? And rather than that being a very proximal sort of question, when did they first get it in their head, it's time to carry this out, and here's what I'm thinking at this point. Instead, how did you become that sort of person who would be in that spot and have to decide whether or not to pull a trigger? What did that have to do with what your brain did just now? Well, that's a pretty obvious, reasonable question. What did it have to do with this morning's hormone levels? A little bit less obvious. What did it have to do with whether in recent months you have undergone a trauma, if you found love, if you lost God, all of those things which would have changed the very structure and function of your brain. But you also then have to be asking about, you know, your adolescence and childhood and fetal life, which turns out to be a very formative time for shaping how your brain is shaped, and then back to your genes and remarkably back to what cultures your ancestors came up with, because that would have been determining how your mother was raising you within minutes of birth. And when you say, where did intent come from? Where did that, how did this person wind up being that kind of person who would intend to do this and then actually do it. You've got to take into account everything from a second ago to you know, the evolution of us as a species and why we have sort of the tendencies that we do. And you have to take everything in between. And when you look at all of those inputs, I concluded there isn't a crack anywhere in there into which you could shoehorn in free will. Well, why does it matter? Why should we be interested in this debate over free will? Well, because every single time uh, somebody tells you like they they thought that like you guys had just hosted a wonderful dinner party and you say thank you and you feel briefly like you are a better human than you thought you were a few seconds ago, whoa, that just shows you that free will and it's, it's uh, a sort of attribution that it actually exists has reared its ugly head. And that has completely colored the situation. And then the same thing comes up with, you know, some other settings, like every time we blame someone for something and we punish them and we decide that justice has been served and that they are culpable, and that retribution is called for. And sometimes retribution could be, you know, a positive in and of itself, could have its own virtue. And every time we praise someone and reward them, basically we're running an entire world on the notion that it's okay to treat some people way better than average, for reasons they had absolutely nothing to do with, and to treat other people way worse than average, similarly. And then when you're done doing that, to preach nonsense about how this is a just world and people get what they deserve. And what they get instead are the consequences of the sheer random luck that has made them who they are, which then gets yoked and, and you know, yoked to this notion of they actually deserve what they get. Well, I just have to ask you, we're recording this right before Thanksgiving, and we always say, don't mm -hmm. thank a deity, thank the cook. Why shouldn't you <laughs> thank somebody who makes a nice meal for you? Or why shouldn't that person say you're welcome? Well, separate of like social niceties, um, that's great. That's actually fine to do. And <clears throat> thanking someone, praising some of them, invoking concepts of free will that they've exercised is okay in a very instrumental sense. Mm. If it makes them, you know, more likely to 
do this again, yeah, that's a good thing if it makes them more likely to feel good about themselves and motivated to try to do good in the world, that's that's a positive as well. If it makes them more likely to feel entitled in the future, not so good because the first two are fairly benign. And similarly, while I'm you know, complaining about how all notions of punishment need to go, every now and then punishment is a useful thing in a purely instrumental way. If it is going to change the likelihood of certain behaviors in the future, that could be great. But don't preach to the person about their soul afterward, and don't think that there is a smidgen of justification in there for thinking that punishment in and of itself as its own virtue makes any sense yeah you know praise and blame are just you know part of the array of ways in which we can shape other people's behavior and they have their place but don't decide that those are virtues in and of themselves and that that has made that person a better or worse one than your average person on the street so in your book determined and in your previous book behave you admit what most of us all feel, that free will just seems like a natural truth. But do you think if we got rid of the idea of free will, our lives would be better? Or should we just keep holding on to the illusion? Yeah. And what we're up against here is the sense of lots of people who believe in free will. And when you look closely, the sense of a lot of people who are kind of skeptical, but they're saying they believe in free will, is what they're actually saying is, oh my God, what's the world going to look like if people stop believing in free will? And a big point that I devote well, the second half of the book to is a lot of the catastrophes that people anticipate are in fact unlikely to occur. And in the most deeply fundamental way, uh, getting people to stop believing in free will will be incredibly liberating and make this a much nicer place to live in. It will make things better rather than worse. Your book is called Determined. Can you tell us what determinism is? In my mind, it's you take somebody and now recognizing, ooh, that brain just produced a behavior and it was wonderful or appalling or ambiguous or in the eye of the beholder or whatever, but that behavior just occurred. And the answer to why did that person intend to do that behavior and carry it out? The answer is because of what came one second before, one minute before, a lifetime before, all of that, uh, stating that who we are now is nothing more or less than the biology over which we had no control, and its interactions with environment over which we had no control. And with that framework, what determinism would count as is you take someone who has just carried out that behavior and give them somebody else's genome, give them a third person's, their childhood, trade this person's theological beliefs change with another person what they had for breakfast this day and what their hormone levels were last night and whether their big toe is hurting and everything in between. And if the behavior that is produced now is exactly the same as before you switched all those things out, for my money, you have just demonstrated free will and you can't do that. And the fact that the behavior would be unrecognizably different once you've changed all those variables or even one of them, is what determinism looks like. So do you agree with those determinists who say that there's only one unique future? No. Um, and here we get into sort of the, the, <laughs> the thickets of things. Um, there's all these like really interesting revolutions that have come about in scientific thinking in recent decades. You know, for, for 500 years, we've been pretty happy with reductionism as an intellectual approach to things. If you want to understand how something complicated works, break it down to its component parts and study those and figure out how they work. And if you still aren't sure, break those down into their component parts and then add all the pieces together and you understand how systems work. And then along comes this whole world of non-linear, non-additive interactions with, you know, terms like chaoticism or emergent complexity. And what they show is some things are fundamentally unpredictable. 
including the future and including about some of the most interesting things out there about the future. This is the world that we have entered of the butterfly effect. And that's great. That's why the future is not completely predictable. But what happens then is all sorts of people get all giddy and excited about chaoticism and emergent complexity, which are totally cool things. But then they decide that somehow what they have discovered is a wellspring for that's where our free will comes from. Our free will is an emergent property. Our free will is a chaotic thing that happens in us. And it simply doesn't work that way because unpredictability and undetermined are not the same thing. Some people say that free will and determinism are compatible. And when we come back from this short break, Professor Sapolsky, we're going to ask you what you say to that. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening, but the religious pushback is fierce and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. Welcome back to Free Thought Matters. We're continuing our conversation with Stanford professor Robert Sapolsky about his new book, Determined, A Science of Life Without Free Will. And when we left off, Robert, we were asking, can determinism and free will be at all compatible? Well, if you ask philosophers, about 95% of them will say absolutely. They are compatibilists. Um, and my answer is they're is no possibility at all for compatibilism. Compatibilism, these are folks who are determinists in the sense that they are willing to say, yes, there is a material world. We're made of stuff like atoms and cells and like there's no magic. And then when you look closely at the arguments that they're making, very often what we're, they're saying is, yeah, 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 we're not invoking magic. We have our reasons for saying that uh, free will is compatible with, with determinism. And when you look closely, the problem is that they are magical reasons that are being invoked. And sort of very sarcastically, I say basically every paper, every treatise, every book you read by a compatibilist invariably can be, you know, trimmed down into three sentences. Sentence number one, wow, neuroscience has taught us all sorts of cool, unexpected stuff about the brain. Sentence number two, wow, some of that cool new neuroscience challenges our very sense of agency and responsibility and free will and who we are as people such that we have to rethink virtually every institution in our life. Sentence number three, nah, it really doesn't work that way. <laughs> you said about 90% of uh, philosophers. What's the percentage among scientists? A lot lower. And, uh, you know, I think that's where you run into a lot of, uh, you know, it's just as well that people believe in free will. So I'm not going to go out on a limb here. Um, I think virtually every neuroscientists, scientists, physicists, etc., would say that we have a lot less free will than people conventionally mm -hmm. think. And if you really pin them to the wall, they would say, we need to make some very major changes in how the world works. Um, but, you know, the thing about neuroscientists is almost certainly what this person has mostly done is spend the last 20 years thinking about this one potassium channel that you find in brine shrimp. So that's really what most of their world is about. But yeah. it, I think most scientists will say our everyday conventional sense of free will um, and the rationalizations, justifications that we then have in place for functioning 
are way, way misplaced. And I know that theologians even don't agree with each other on free will. Some, some say it and some don't. So talking about religion, you're not a theist and you're not a theologian, but how do you think rejecting free will might affect the theological ideas of, of deserved salvation and divine punishment? I think it immediately gets you into, again, as you said, what type of theism you are into. Um, and, you know, people often mistake a scientific argument against free will for somehow meaning we're talking about pilgrims with buckles on their shoes and a, a theological predeterminism where God already has. You know, it's not that. It's a very different stripe. And obviously, different sorts of religions come up with different views about it. Um, but what they often promulgate is an immediate panicked sort of response when saying there's no free will of, oh, my God, so to speak. People are just going to run amok if they think there's no free will. We can't tell people that. People will fall into this Hobbesian, you know, murk of disinhibited sort of violence and selfishness and all of that. And whether or not there is free will, but we think there is, um, people really need to think there is because otherwise people will run amok. There's been some nice experimental support for this idea. You take people, volunteers, and you manipulate them psychologically into believing they have less agency uh, than they thought they did before. Um, and then you show, whoa, in the hour afterward, they're more likely to cheat, cheat on a game. They're more likely to make some lousy sort of selfish offer to another player in some economic game. Wow, if people stop believing in free will, they're going to run amok. And, you know, this has been a very influential bunch of studies. Um, they have not all replicated. Big surprise, as is often the case in that business. Um, but then you look at a different sort of person. Don't take your Psych 101 volunteer freshman who shows up and manipulate them into feeling less in free will. Get somebody who shows up saying, I don't believe in free will. I haven't believed in it for years. And look at them, and they are as exactly as ethical in their behavior as in someone who believes passionately in free will, and we need to be held responsible. There's an interesting similarity there, a parallelism, and I like devote one chapter in the book to that, um, in terms of it being similar to the oh my God, you don't believe in God. How can you possibly behave ethically? And then when you look closely, when you look at people who are stridently atheistic, they are exactly as ethical, if not more so in their behavior, than people who are stridently religious and very high levels of ethical behavior in both places. What's that about? And I think what we're seeing here is this interesting similarity, whether it is you believe or reject a god, or whether you believe or reject free will, if this is what you've been believing for a long time, you've thought long and hard about this, and you have reflected on the nature of human goodness and the nature of human evil, and if there is such a thing as evil, and where does meaning come from? And my feeling is at that point, it almost doesn't matter if you conclude there's nothing but free will, or there's no free will whatsoever, you've already thought long and hard about the important questions. You already have constructed some sort of moral picture of yourself based on your conclusion. Well, when Eve chose to eat the apple, <laughs> was that free will? And if not, then how can the human race be condemned? You know, unless he gets some, like, theologically derived neurotransmitters in her imaginary <laughs> frontal cortex, you know, there's not much to talk about there. But I think what we see here is, you know, at least for my money, what turns out to be the most knee-jerk response on people's part, oh, my God. That can't be true, and even if it is, you can't tell people that they'll run amok, is not the case. Um, and if you want to see that empirically, just look at those like fun utopian Scandinavians who run their world on far less of a dependence on free will than we do. And among other things, they got like a vastly lower recidivism rate from their prisons and lower crime rates and much higher rates of people being nice to each other, not to mention governments that see it as their duty to take care of their people. Um, now, what I see 
most typically is the second thing people then freak out about is they're saying, oh, great, you're saying there's no free will. What, you're saying nothing can ever change? And anything but that, obviously, people change enormously. Cultures change enormously, all of that. But where people get into this free will problem is you do something different tomorrow than you do today. You think of it as, ah, I chose to change. I decided to change. And when you look at what actually goes on is you arrived at some moment being the sort of person you are because of things you had no control over, how you became to be that sort of person. And something occurs, some stimulus out there in the world. And because you are this kind of person, you are changed in this particular way. And we mistake the circumstances where you are changed for being ones where we have expressed free will and have chosen to change. I mean, here's here's an example that comes to mind. You go and you see some wonderful movie that's about some inspiring person who is just a regular old guy and suddenly from out of nowhere does something incredibly heroic and noble. And like one person comes out of the movie theater changed by the experience. They say, wow, that was incredible. I feel so inspired by that person. Tomorrow I'm going to go like volunteer for Amnesty International. And the second person comes out changed by the experience. And they say, wow, that was such an amazing movie. That was amazing cinematography. Tomorrow I am going to learn more about the cinematographer. And the third person comes out and changed. They say, wow, that was the most emotionally manipulative, you know, superficial, awful movie ever. Tomorrow I'm going to look up every single movie that director has ever made. And I'm going to avoid them from now on. Wow. None of those people chose to change in that way. All of them were changed. And all of them were changed in different ways because they were made sculpted by circumstance into being different sorts of people going into that moment. And there is an astonishing, heartwarming, neural plasticity based potential for all of us to change. But that has nothing to do with whether or not there's free will. Well, thank you, Robert Sapolsky, for choosing to be with us today on this show. Mm -hmm. We really enjoyed the conversation. Well, as always, likewise, and, uh, you know, a salute to you guys on the uphill heroic battle you guys have been waging, and keep going, and I'm forever in your court. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because free thought matters. <laughs>